All right, Dalton, we broke down my top 10 quarterback rooms in college football, top 10 running back units, top 10 receiving cores, top 10 offensive lines. Now let's move to the defensive side of the ball, finally, man. It's a, it's a loaded defensive side that we have in college football this year. We're going to start off with my top 10 defensive lines in college football entering the 2023 season. Of course, another perfect list by me that you can find over at pff.com. Um, and yeah, let's start off with my number 10 D-line in the country, which is Oregon. There's one word to describe Oregon's defensive line, Dawn. It is large. All four of Oregon's projected starters at edge and interior defensive line weigh at least 270 pounds, and the average weight is over 300 pounds. Not only do tackle, edge defenders as well are over 270. So they're really good at run defenders. Um, they brought in a couple great transfers at D-tackle and Derek Harmon and Jamari Caldwell, um, and both of them really good run defenders. I have some questions about how Oregon's going to rush the passer next year, especially with guys that big, but they are outstanding run defenders. It's going to be uh, really hard to run the ball on Oregon next year. So they're at number 10. Number 9 is Clemson. We already broke down Peter Woods in his own video, one of the best true freshman D tackles we've seen in recent memory. Uh, TJ Parker, they also brought back as one of their edge defenders. Um, he was a true freshman as well last year. Uh, he excelled as a run defender. He had 83 run defense grade, which was eighth among Power 5 edges last year. So Clemson at number 9. Number 8 is Texas, who lost Byron Murphy, lost to Vondre Sweat, but still should have a really good defensive line. Alfred Collins, I think, is going to be a breakout star next year. He had an 11% pressure rate, which is second among Big 12 D tackles. They also returned both their starting edge defenders from a year ago in Baron Sorrell and uh, Ethan Burke, who each earned 70-plus grades. And they added Trey Moore uh, from UTSA in the transfer portal, who was fourth among group of five edges last year with 13 sacks. And... They brought in true freshman edge defender Colin, uh, Colin Simmons, uh, who was a top 15 overall recruit in the 2024 class. And honestly, don't I watched some of his tape in high school. I thought he should have been higher than top 15, man. That guy is a super, super uh, athlete for uh, the Longhorns. I think he could make an immediate impact as a true freshman. So at number eight is Texas. At number seven is Penn State. Who again, like Texas, lost some key pieces like Chop, uh, Chop Robinson and Adisa Isaac to their two edge defenders. But Abdul Carter moving up from linebacker to edge defender this year. He's already a top 10 edge in the country, even though he hasn't really played it before because of how freaky of an athlete he is and how good of a pass rusher he is as well. Um, he had a 24.1% pass rush win rate that led all FBS linebackers with at least 100 pass rushing snaps. That also would have been third among all edge defenders in the country as well. Denied Dennis Sutton, the other edge defender for Penn State, was fourth among Big Ten edges last year with an 18% pass rush win rate. Freaky tools, too. He's a former five-star recruit. Um, they also, Penn State also brought back its top four D tackles from last year, and all four of them earned a 70-plus PFF grade. So I think high upside at edge defender with uh, uh, Abdul Carter and Denied Dennis Sutton, who also both of them could be first-round picks if they really break out next year. And then they bring back so much experience at defensive tackle, who all were pretty good last year, too. Uh, at number six now is Notre Dame, who has the second best D tackle duo in the country. We already broke down both of them if you want to see them, and Howard Cross and Riley Mills, two of our top 10 D tackles in, in the nation. Um, and then also at edge defender, they have RJ Oben coming in from Duke. Uh, he was 10th among ACC edges last year with a 14% pass rush win rate so 10 through 6 dawn number 10 oregon 9 clemson 8 texas 7 penn state and 6 notre dame anything that sticks out in that top 10 anyone that's missing from that top 10 what do you think what do you think about that list so far um i think there could be some arguments uh in the back end like at number 10 like i think about a team like um say like a virginia tech who has um like an es peoples coming in there and antoine Powell, um Powell Ryland, like got teams like that. But I, I can see Oregon too. They have a lot of depth. Um, I think two of the stories that stick out to me are, are Texas. And look, you lose two close to first round type of guys. One of them was, one went in the second round. Uh, I'm curious to see. I like Alfred Collins a lot too. I'm with you. I, I'm curious to see how he does in a more featured role instead of being that third guy. And then you mentioned Trey Moore from UTSA. He's been really, really good for them. He had 13 sacks last year. Uh, if he can make that jump up to SEC competition and be really good. Texas's pass defense in general is probably the biggest question for me, and part of it is those two guys they're replacing up front. Those were their two best players on their entire yeah. team. I know they had Xavier Worthy and Mitchell and Ewers and everything else. Murphy and Sweat kept the whole thing held together, especially when Quinn Ewers was hurt. Their run defense was big time. We'll see what Collins looks like in a more featured role, but 
I, I find this this Penn State duo really, really intriguing, man. I, I think Carter and Dennis Sutton have as much talent as any pair, as anybody in the country, especially Carter. Like, we've talked about Abdul Carter. That's a freak of nature. The Micah Parsons comps are coming. If, in part, because of those two guys, that they could be higher on this list by the end of the year. That's yeah. Penn State's always a nasty pass-rushing team. And I know they lost Chop and Isaac, but these two guys might even be freakier than them. I, I mean, Carter and Robinson, I think, I think compare pretty reasonably. Um, Dennis Sutton might be more explosive than Adisa Isaac. Uh, it, this, you've got two guys who could really take over games. Um, and I think Penn State, they just rotate. They, they had so many. Last year, they just rotated them so much, right? You're going to see these two guys featured a lot more this year, and they could move up this list. Yeah, absolutely. And like I said, they brought back their top four D tackles last year and all four of them really solid players too. So I think that, that matters a lot And that, yeah, you're breaking in a couple new starters at edge defender, but you bring back so much experience at D tackle and all four of them, like I said, play pretty well too. So uh, anything else that sticks out in your top 10 or you want to move on to five to one now? Um, I think I think let it rip because there's a lot that's going to stick out to me in the top five. Uh-oh. Okay. All right. Let's get into it then. At number five for me is Ole Miss, who... And any defensive list would look like uh, very out of place, but not on this one, man, because they added a lot in the transfer portal. Prince Lee Monmielen, one of our top 10 edge defenders in the country coming in from Florida, and they added Walter Nolan at D-tackle, former number one overall recruit in 2022. He had seven sacks this past year, which tied for third among SEC D-tackles, uh, also third with eight tackles for loss or no gain. So coming in from Texas A&M is Walter Nolan, coming in from Florida is Prince Lee Monmielen. I think if both of them have big years next year, they could be first-round picks in the NFL draft. So the fact that Ole Miss added two potential first-round picks in the NFL draft and Walter Nolan and Prince Leon Mielin, good enough to be a top five on my list. At number four is Georgia, who brought back four defensive linemen who played at least 325 snaps last year. All of them earned 70-plus PFF grades. The biggest name from that bunch is undoubtedly Michael Williams, um, who's been a number one overall pick in a lot of mock drafts. Not ours, Dalton, but a lot of other mock drafts. We still think there's a lot of work to be done to get to that point, but there is no denying that he's got talent and power at six foot five. 265 pounds and unsurprisingly Georgia also has some highly touted freshmen and sophomores uh, and Damon Wilson, Jordan Hall, uh, Joseph, Jonah, Ajanye, all of them were former five-star recruits in their respective classes and all of them are projected backups for Georgia this year. So talented backups at Georgia and the depth of that room is why they're at number four. At number three is Miami who has the deepest group of edge defenders in college football. We already broke down Ruben Bain Jr., the best freshman edge we've seen uh, since Miles Garrett, and the only one who was better is Miles Garrett. Um, and opposite of him is Tyler Barron, who was sixth among SEC edges last year with 41 pressures. He played for Tennessee last year. They also added uh, Elijah Alston from Marshall, in the transfer portal, Alston had a 91.3 grade, which was third among all edge defenders in the country. So the guy who's the third highest graded edge in the country last year is their backup edge defender next year. That's insane. If that's not enough for you, Akeem Mesidor, a lot of people kind of forget about him too. He only played two games this last year due to a foot injury. The year before that, though, he was fifth among power five edges with an 87.2 grade. So you're talking about a guy who's a top five edge defender in the Power Five in 2022 as your number four edge defender next year. Miami's defensive edge room is ridiculous. They also added Simeon Barrow from Michigan State at D-tackle. He's a really, really good D-tackle. And they also brought in three five-star true freshmen at defensive line, whether it be edge defender or D-tackle. So bring up a, a really they, – look, they have a beautiful unit for the present right now. And for the future, with Ruben Bain coming back and those three five stars as well, I'm Miami man, number three, could argue them up uh, a little bit higher. But number two for me is Michigan. Uh, even after losing Chris Jenkins, who's a top 50 pick in the draft, they also bring back the best defensive tackle duo by far in college football. And Mason Graham, the best D tackle in the nation, where you broke him down in a video, and Kenneth Grant, uh, who's a top, I think, five D tackle in our video. At least he's number six for me in my ranking. But uh, yeah, so two top five D tackles in the country. And then also Josiah Stewart, top 10 edge defender for us in the country as well. Uh, Derek Moore also earned a 78 uh, grade, uh, or at least above a 78 grade this last year as well. So Michigan number two. But at number one is Ohio State 
who saw uh, three defensive linemen return for their senior years, despite the fact that all three of them would have likely been day two picks in the 2024 NFL draft if they declared for it. Uh, Jack Sawyer, JT Tumaloa, the best edge defender duo in the country. Um, they both were top 10 edges in the nation in our list. Um, Sawyer was number three on our list. And Tyleek Williams, one of my top five D tackles in the country, uh, tied for fourth in the power five with a 26, with 26 run defense stops last year. And then Ty Hamilton, is the other starting D tackle. He had a 76.4 grade on 350 snaps last year as well. So I think the top three, you can argue any of them for number one, Don. I sided with Ohio State because I like um, the overall room because uh, I think all four of them I really, really like. Whereas Michigan, like um, I think they're just solid at edge defender right now. I think Ohio State's a little bit better at that aspect. But, man, you could argue for any of them at number one for Michigan, Miami, Ohio State. So what are the – you said you, you wanted to talk about this top five a lot. What are the things that stand out in the top five? We'll start right at the top, and I think I'm gonna I'm gonna take the other side of the rivalry. Uh, I, I think I would go Michigan number one, okay. um, and and I like Jack Sawyer a ton. Tuimoloau and Tyleek Williams are very very talented, but I need consistency out of both of them. And, and I think for me, especially, look, Kenneth Grant is a lot better than I thought he was going back and watching him a second time a couple weeks ago. He's an awesome player, but Mason Graham. Uh, I, I think there's a bit of a tie break here. Mason Graham is a transcendent player. He might be the best just football player at any position in college football next year. Uh, like I, I keep talking about like he could be in for a Quinn and Williams type of season. He's that good. So the the rooms are probably pretty comparable. Uh, Josiah Stewart too is, is really, really good off the edge for Michigan. He's going to play a little bit more. Um, but for me, I, I think Mason Graham would actually be a bit of a tiebreaker Um when it comes to that between those two, I would have Michigan one and lean, even if it's a little more top heavy towards Graham, he's a transcendent. If there's any guy in the country, I would guarantee today that would be a top 10 pick next year. It's Mason Graham. Now, I think he's the safest pick in the draft next year. And then I, I'm really two and three, man. I'm real tempted to say Miami's number two. They are, Ooh. they are deeper than deep, man. Uh, Ruben Bain. We've talked about Tyler Barron, Elijah Alston. I'll tell you Mesador. I'll tell you another guy. Marley Cook that they got from Middle Tennessee had a 90 pass rush grade two years ago. Like they, they are so loaded with pass rushers. You're gonna see four and five man units next year in like deep down and distance, like on third and tens, that Miami just looks unblockable. Like this Miami's defensive line is actually the thing that makes me think they could win the conference more so than Cam Ward and Damian Martinez and all. I think that is actually, like, if you're going to play Miami this year, that's actually your biggest problem is how in the world are we blocking all these freaks? Yeah. They got – I mean, <clears throat> these are these are not just uh, – this is not a collection of decent players. Reuben Bain was a top-10 guy for us. Simeon Barrow was awesome at Michigan State. Tyler Brown was awesome at Tennessee. Elijah Alston, you mentioned, I think, was it third in, third in the country in overall grade? It yeah. was basically like – Layatu Latu and then Elijah Alston, which is nuts. Like, I think I I would go Michigan, Miami, Ohio State. Wow, as the top three because Miami's just so it's crazy the number of guys that they've brought in on top of Ruben Bain who they already had. Like, and they're losing a really good player, say in Leonard Taylor, and they just reloaded. Like, like it's by far, and I know Clemson's really good too, but to me. The, the unit to watch in the ACC for any team at any position is Miami's defensive line. This is the thing that could actually win them the conference. Interesting. Okay, so you you take my number one D line and put, drop them all the way down to number three. And I don't hate it, dude. I, like I said, I think any of the top three you could order in any way you want, and I would understand it. Uh, I decided at the Ohio State because I, I, re I really do like the edge defenders of Sawyer and Tua Malowau, Um And I think Tyleek Williams is a great D tackle. And I love uh, Ty Hamilton as well. Um, they also have some good recruits coming in uh, on the D line as well. So um, that's why I sided with Ohio State. But it was really difficult uh, picking between them, Michigan, and Miami uh, for that number one spot. Anything else that sticks out, Dalton, in that top five or anything that you might move a team up or down on this list or anything like that? I think, I think four and five are both interesting. I think some people would have Georgia higher because of Michael Williams. But I, honestly, when we were digging through the numbers during the season last year, their pass rush was actually really their biggest weakness. They, yeah. they did not have a great pass rush last year, despite all the big names. And Ole, and Ole Miss, too, is very interesting. I think you have a case of two guys in Michael Williams and Walter Nolan, where obviously the recruiting, the frame, the tools are all there. 
but I'm always in the boat of like, okay, now I have to see you do it, right? Like Walter Nolan at Texas A&M was like solid, but he wasn't transcendent like his recruiting profile yeah. would tell you, right? If he can go there and do that, and obviously Uman Mielin's really, really good. He's going to be a top 50 pick next year. Walter, Ole Miss, they could land at five by the end of the year. If Nolan hits his potential, they could be top three, or if he doesn't, they could be off this list by the end of the year. I, I think the two that you have here at four or five, I think are very much based more on talent than the, ex, except for Uman Mielin. He's he's awesome. He's given us three years at Florida, just spectacular. Like I look at like Notre Dame and two guys who have really, especially last year, already. To, I might have Notre Dame ahead of at least Ole Miss because of what we've seen from Cross and Mills last year. You know, it, two different types of guys, and, that, and and they're just stacked on defense anyway. I know they're a little weaker off of the edge. Uh, that's probably the weakest unit on their defense. But I, I might I might go Notre Dame over Ole Miss and maybe have an argument about Georgia. I know Georgia's got a bunch of kids, man. They're loaded with talent. They're always loaded with talent. So I could see – Notre Dame at five or four, but I, I think I would put them ahead of Ole Miss. Okay. Yes, fair enough. I think Georgia, the pass rushing is an issue, but I think as a run defense, run defending D line, they're really, really good. And Williams clearly has really high talent and really good talent and high upside with uh, how much he's been mocked in the top one of, of mock drafts, which you and I don't agree with. But uh, Warren Brinson they have as well. D-tackle, he's really good. Nazir Stackhouse is solid. Chaz Chambliss is solid. And I mentioned all the, the recruits they have, man. It's just nuts what they have uh, there as well. But uh, anything else that sticks out on the list, Alan, or are you, uh, are you good to move on? Uh, I, I think I'm good. A little more a little more arguing at the top this time around. Um, but, but yeah, the, the those... Yes, these defensive linemen, man. These there are some freaks in college football right now too. I, I think it's Ohio State and Michigan. What what they give us in 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 their game every year in the trenches is just it looks like an NFL game. So Dolan doesn't agree that I have a perfect list, but uh, let me know in the comments below whether or not you agree with Dolan or you think this is a perfect list below. So let us know what you think the best defensive lines in college football are right now. We have a couple more of these position unit rankings coming out soon. Next week in our linebacker units and secondaries in college football, in addition to uh, some more rankings of positions. But after that, we have our preview of every single team in the Power Four, uh, the Pac-12 teams that got left behind, too. We're doing them. Notre Dame, 10 group of five schools as well. Stay tuned for that because if you're a fan of one of those teams, if you're a fan of one of those 80 teams I just mentioned, uh, yeah, we're, we're going to be previewing your team in depth uh, on this channel as well. So make sure you guys subscribe to the channel for that so you don't miss any of our videos previewing the 2024 college football season.